Hi everyone, welcome. Thanks for your patience as we were getting everything ready. We're about to make a start. Um, we're just gonna give it a couple more seconds, but uh, welcome. So um, anyway, thank you again for joining us today. Uh, my name is Louisa Uliet and I'm curator of talks and events at the Photographer's Gallery. This is a special event to reflect on the ongoing environmental emergency we are in. Held today, this event also marks the um, COP26 summit taking place in Glasgow, where thousands have been gathering as we seek climate justice and solutions to the cat catastrophe that we are in. I'm delighted to introduce this evening's speakers, artist Chica Brain, Emilia Scarmelite, and curator Mar Marlies Firth. Together, they will consider the important part art, photography, and technology can have in this, not just in raising awareness, but also in developing meaningful connections to climate change and triggering new imageries that can stir us into action. Tika Brain is an Australian born artist and environmental engineer. In her work, she examines issues of ecology, data systems and infrastructure. She has created wireless networks that respond to natural phenomena along with other projects, which include systems for obfuscating fitness data and an online smell based dating service. Her work has been shown widely, including in the Vienna Biennale for Change and the Guangxi Triennial. Her first book, Coda's Creative Medium, came out this year and is co-authored by Golan Levin. Amelia Scarmelite is an artist and filmmaker. Working between documentary and the imag imaginary, she makes films and immersive installations exploring deep time and invisible structures that touch on geology, politics, and ecology. She won the 2019 Future Generation Art Prize and was featured in the Baltic Pavilion at the 2018 Venice Biennial of Architecture. Her most recent work, Eternal Return, was recent, recently displayed at Tate Modern. Set 10,000 years into the future, it looks back at the past, our present, and studies the damage done to our ecosystem through occurrences like floodings, earthquakes, and oil spills. She is founder and currently co-directs Polar Film Lab, a collective for analog film practice located in Tromso, Norway, and is a member of the artist duo New Mineral Collective. Marlies Firth is an artist, art historian and curator based in Vienna, working at the Museum of Applied Arts. As a curator for digital culture there, she has a key role in the programming of the Venice Biennial in 2015-2021 and has organized exhibitions and programs in the fields of art, design, architecture, and technology. Recent exhibit, exhibitions include Invocation for Hope, a commission by Superflex, and Climate Care. She also works independently on writing and curatorial projects that focus on conceptual art and cultural anthropological context for artistic production. Uh, joining us from the US, Lithuania, and Australia, respectively, we're really excited to be here with all three of them tonight as we look at the geological and ecological consequences of our actions and, and consider our role in that. In terms of format, the event should last roughly one hour in total. Please note we are recording this, however, you will not be featured and will only appear at the end if you decide to post your questions directly. We are approaching this event as we do with all of our public programs with the aim of creating a form of trust and mutual respect, so please keep that in mind in the chat form. And before we start, I want to thank you again for joining us. We hope to see you again at some of our other forthcoming online activities, and even more hopefully at the gallery where we're currently showing a retrospective of American photographer, Helen Levitt, and a new commission by British artist, Helen Kamek. Anyway, thank you all again. And now to Tika Brain, Amelia Scarmelite, and Marlies Firth. Thank you so much, Louisa, for having us and for inviting me to um, moderate this talk with just two amazing artists. Um, pleasure to see you here, Tika and Amelia. And maybe to start off, um, I would invite uh, both of the artists, uh, Tika first and then Emilia, to show um, two uh, seminal works of theirs that have a lot to do with what we are going to talk about today. And I would ask Tiga to start with the presentation. Hi, thank you so much. It's, it's really lovely to be here. And um, I also appreciate, yeah, the work that, and, and discussions that are happening in the context of the Photographer's Gallery so much. So thank you for the invitation. And yeah, lovely to, to have this opportunity to talk about um, my work, uh, particularly right now as, as the COP26 is going on. Um, so my practice is very much informed by my background in environmental engineering. I'm really interested in the way that technologies are shaping and reshaping how we imagine the environment, how we think we can act on it, um, you know, who has agency to decide how we make decisions about its management. Uh, and so 
yeah, my work over the past few years has explored these questions, particularly looking at issues around the use of artificial intelligence in environmental management and how that's changing, you know, the way decisions are made and, and um, attitudes towards environments. So just to give you a sense of some works that address these questions, um, I will share my screen so you can take a look at them. Um, yeah, so a few works to give you a taste of what this looks like. Um, this was a work, uh, Asanda, a collaboration with Julian Oliver and Bank Sojin that was actually commissioned by the MAC by Mali. So um, you'll know this one well, but this is a project that sort of presents an autonomous environmental manager. Uh, it imagines what um, it would look like if we were to automate decisions about how we were to engineer the, the globe or the, the, the planet um, using artificial intelligence systems. And so the work um, uses a GAN to sort of generate engineering scenarios by making modifications to Landsat satellite tiles. And so the GAN sort of dreams up these um, engineering uh, edits to different places around the world and in doing so sort of raises questions about what role we want AI to have in the context of environment. Um, let me see if I can change, give you a few more views of this work. Um, so it's a big large screen projection and you see these sort of modified imagined satellite images projected into the space. And the manager then makes assessments on which um, it's sort of choosing which scenario it wants to implement um, to address, you know, particular areas around the world that are particularly significant in view of the current ecological emergency. So we look at places like Brazil, where there's issues around deforestation, um, places like Silicon Valley, where these technologies are coming from. And the system runs on this sort of large computer, this custom supercomputer that sits in the space as well. Once each scenario is generated, the work then uses a traditional, uh, a conventional climate model to try to assess the performance of each engineering proposal. So we're also combining these different types of modeling, you know, the statistical AI um, methods of modeling with um, numerical modeling. So this is, this is how it happens in, in climate science. Um, very much exploring, you know, questions of simulation and, you know, how, what sort of imagination that produces for how we can act in the world. Um, so that project, yeah, let me let me share um, another work that is addressing these issues from sort of a different point of view. Um, to give you a, a sense of a more participatory work that um, I. I developed again, it's a collaborative work with um, Benedetta Piantella and Alex Nathanson. Um, and this project similarly is exploring automation in the context of environment, but rather than exploring a sort of automation by artificial intelligence, it explores this question of like, what if we were to um, read environmental logics as a kind of natural intelligence? What if we could, um, look at environmental dynamics such as you know the distribution of solar energy around the world and automate our technological systems with these logics instead why don't we recognize automation as a part of a healthy ecology you know with the same kind of enthusiasm as we talk about it in the context of you know computer science and so to do this this work takes the form of a network of solar powered servers. What is a solar powered server? Well, it looks something like this. It's um, a small single board computer, such so as a Raspberry Pi, that is powered by a solar panel. When the solar panel goes into sunlight, you know, the battery charges, the Pi goes on. Um, in the sort of deep dark winter of New York City, we were finding that the, the Pi's would sort of go off around four or five in the afternoon depending on how much work you're having them do, of course. And so we've set up these solar servers in different time zones in different locations around the world where we're working with lots of different volunteers to do this. So we have about 10 set up at the moment. And the, the network then collectively hosts 
um, the web platform. So we can go to solarprotocol.net and that web platform, if I can go there, <laughs> at the moment you can see it's coming from our uh, solar server located in Queens because that is the server in the network that's getting the most sunshine. So it's the sort of active server serving this web platform. And so the routing or the way that internet traffic is directed in our network is very much dependent on the distribution of energy around the world. So where the sun is shining, what the weather's been like, who is in the most, you know, who's had the sunniest days lately. Um, and, you know, we're trying to sort of explore this, this, uh, you know, automation, not from a sort of human centered point of view, also not from a sort of like data centered point of view, as in our, our AI technologies, but what does it look like if we try to center, you know, environmental dynamics um, in, in how we automate our technologies. So this means that, you know, sometimes, um, you know, there's intermittency or it gives, it, it actually produces a very different way you would design as well, which I think I'm very interested in. And, you know, I think we need to be imagining and thinking about these things if um, in a, if as we move towards a low carbon or hopefully no carbon world. Um, if I had time, I can talk about one more work that's sort of addressing these questions as well. Um, maybe really quickly, I'll just throw it in the mix. Um, so this is a work that's sort of one of my more recent um, projects called Synthetic Messenger. It's also a collaboration with Sam Levine. As you can see, I collaborate a lot. <laughs> Um, and synthetic messenger is continuing these questions of, you know, how can we leverage technologies of automation um, for a, a more climate friendly world? And this particular work uh, uses automation to produce a botnet. So it's addressing these questions of climate from the perspective of media and narrative. Um, and so synthetic, synthetic messenger consists of a botnet uh, that goes out and clicks on ads that are running alongside of climate news. So the media is now very much shaped by algorithms. Um, a lot of it is automated. Um, a lot of what news gets aggregated depends on, you know, the how much um, uh how many people are clicking on it what sort of advertising revenue it's raising for the news outlet and we wanted to sort of leverage this behavior this emergent behavior that's come out of the automation of media to see if we could sort of use it to amplify um climate news and climate coverage um and by doing this point to the way that the media is really a central part of how we address the issues of climate change, right? And so our sort of provocation is, you know, imagining media manipulation as a potential climate engineering strategy, you know, and, and understanding the media cycle as part of the climate cycle. And so the work was presented in, at the STRP festival earlier this year, and it consists of, uh, it consisted of all the bots performing their activities in the context of a Zoom call. So it's this kind of hellish Zoom call where you're with, with sort of a hundred bots who are all going around the internet clicking on, on news articles and ads. <laughs> Very much a, um, let me stop oh. that. <laughs> very much a pandemic uh, responsive work as well, right? So we were thinking about performance and creating this experience, using the Zoom call as this sort of, uh, this stage, this opportunity to, um, yeah, have our bots perform and, and share their activities to a, to a live audience. Thank you so much, Tiga, for these insights. I think these are three very astounding works that show uh, the perspective that you are coming from. Like uh, from my notes, like looking into the future and very much also as an engineer looking into doing things with the climate or um, using manipulation as a strategy. Whereas now I would invite Amelia to share uh, insights about her work and the most recent one, Eternal Return, being something that's looking back at us uh, from 10,000 years in the future. Yeah, so always um yeah i think i try to 
think and reimagine these time scales in mm -hmm. comparison to our daily life and rewriting history into a scenario where other species and other non-human beings can be at home on this planet. And I'm interested in giving evidence of how altered states of consciousness arise through sensing and learning both from underwater um, formations of new species and deep time geological scale, trying to look in depths of oceans and trying to have this grip on the reality and changing planet. So today just uh, I came out from installing um, upcoming show in two days in Konas Biennial in Lithuania. It's a new work, Absolute Dating. It's an, in a natural history museum in Lithuania. So um, I'm trying to see these like stratas of the um, objects that are invisible and unscalable already to like human perception and somehow to bring them closer. So I'm working in this mammals room right now with like techno cave and lasers and uh, hazers, more like inviting the viewer in to, to feel all these many extinct species to kind of um, revitalizing. So I'm just coming from that, but uh, right now, the second, but um, to, to talk more in general, this, what we see now, it's, um, it's a part of a um, trilogy or continuing piece, um, Sunken Cities, that was filmed in um, Napoli, in a Sunken Roman cities. I was training for a year, like to, to kind of see it in apnea underwater, these lost civilization. So in a way, often like the sci-fi futures are already all around us and it's not so far actually need to look for it. And uh, after seeing this Uncan City, um, like with all the traces of civilization, streets and houses, I kind of dove there into, and that's also a continuation of Cyrenomelia previous piece, where I was looking through mythological characters' point of view, this cyborg, um, cyborg, Cyrenomelia, woman, torpedo, kind of a mythological character guiding us through Cold War ruins, we like, and myths. And uh, next one is uh, clips of actually um, continuation of these characters in the dialogue that meet often in architectural space. I always interested in sculptural aspect of filmmaking and image making. I graduated in sculpture and I think always the video and photography is always like this medium which um, I shape. The pixels are like clay and um, more like trying to create these immersive spaces. And the next one, 
Sunken Cities was the summer in Switzerland, Pasquart, in Kunsthaus Pasquart, where I tried to create these portals and entrances to the sunken cities. There were 10 rooms with black liquid ceiling, reflecting ceiling some, and uh, we were more as, you know, I tried to get the audience closer to these uranium sites where I've been filming for the last six years, different nuclear power plants I'm interested in decommissioning process and as creating these colossal hazardous burial sites for future generations. Also four kilometer depths of water in Gulf of Mexico. And the next slide is from the recent uh, installation that happened just um, recently in at Tate Modern South Tanks, where I tried to kind of bring us to this darkest place on earth. It's four kilometer depths in this um, so-called um, apphotic zone where it's like very little light and very little oxygen. Oh, Amelia, are you still there? It's in Gulf of Mexico. Yeah. So very glad to be here and join the Panel. Fantastic. Thank you both so much for sharing these insights into your work and also to give us some images, which helps, um, I think, also our guests a lot who have, uh, such as myself, not been able to be there and see these works in person um, at some point. And I think it's really interesting how you approach these issues of, of climate change as media artists with technology and maybe to give you all also some background. Um, what uh, my work at the Museum of Applied Arts in Vienna was about in the past few years. So, uh, the work Asunder that Tiger mentioned in the beginning also of her talk. Uh, is Emilia still here? Oops. <laughs> um, has been commissioned by the MAC Vienna for our Vienna Biennale in 2019. That's a two, two year format that we have been hosting since 2015. And it had the topic uncanny values or um, yeah, the new values we need to create together with our technologies and non-human actors. And um, when working on that show and specifically commissioning the work Asunder and asking those guys like to come up with some um, work that would imagine this all empowered technology to help us with climate change, we already figured um, climate is obviously a big issue and dedicated a whole new uh, the whole next Vienna Biennale, which just ended in October this year, to this topic with the title Climate Care. And uh, we're looking at um, climate change from different angles, from the creative field. So the Vienna Biennale and the exhibitions at MAC are not only concerned for uh, fine arts, but we also include design, architecture, technology, activism in our exhibitions and try to connect also the protagonists of those fields together and try to empower our visitors also to see what can be done. And we have uh, seen uh, that the role of the different disciplines is very different, obviously. So with design, you can have practical solutions to something. You, have, you can have a, a CO2 capturing device or with architecture, you can um, decide not to build with concrete, but with wood uh, instead and, and to implement several urban strategies. But then when it comes to art and their opens for me a very interesting portal of knowledge. Um, we can learn so many different things than solutions. And I think what was mentioned like uh, earlier as well, uh, the media is covering climate change nowadays, like every second, I think, with an article or a tweet or 
uh, sad news about um, a, pro a new problem that arises. But then um, contemporary artists can uh, do so much more with that and dream up a different reality. So I would start uh, my questioning with Tiger because I said, like before, you're looking into the future. Um, are we at the point where adaptation and mitigation are not sufficient uh, and we have to engineer? Or what's your take on that? Oh, that is such a contentious question. I know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think we have to be very pragmatic. Like, mm -hmm. we have, we needed to address this, like, you know, 30 years ago, and we haven't. We can talk about why we haven't. <laughs> So I do think um, we need to look at engineering options. I think we have to also acknowledge that a lot of these are like super speculative, right? Like the Asunder project also dealt with that um, somewhat, but we are not, we like a lot of the sort of um, better known geoengineering proposals, are not, they're not, very far developed, right? They're still very much in the kind of research phase. And so it's a it's a term, I guess, you know, when we talk about whether you call it climate engineering or geoengineering that is vague and that maybe is, is, is not so useful for its vagueness, right? It sort of can encapsulate a lot of different responses, whether that be like tree planting, which, you know, we absolutely need to do through to like, you know, solar, radiation management, which is a, you know, much more speculative, like unknown, undeveloped idea. And so I think we need to sort of be specific about like what kind of interventions we're thinking about. I think absolutely like carbon capture in a lot of different formats needs to be on the table and we need to really think about the way these technologies get explored and then are considered, right? If I think where there is a risk of like not wanting to go there, if you like, which then positions, you know, industries like the fossil fuel industry that are responsible for this as, you know, uh, industries who are well positioned to then take control of them or shape how those technologies get rolled out. So I actually think we really need to be having these conversations and we really need to be considering all of these options because we're in a, <laughs> we're in a terrible place, you know, it is an emergency, yeah. absolutely. We are, we are. And I uh, remember with Asanda, there was one of those scenarios that showed Dubai, the city in the desert, where I had just been a year before Asanda was created and uh, some friends were visiting the show and looked at the scenario and the scenario proposed that where the city is in the middle of the desert, there should not be a city because it would be much more sustainable. And then you ask yourself, but what about the people? What about the human beings living their lives there, building their existence there? So um, coming to Emilia's take with the uh, looking back um, at, at some creatures from a far future, um, is human survival on top of the list or um, how is the world without humans just as good? Um, how did you go about that thought when you developed your uh, recent work where you look back from a time where there might be other creatures, other beings that might not be human as we know them? You're, you're muted, by the way, sorry. Maybe it's often like, thank you for the question, but um, yeah, maybe have a vision already of extinct, at, maybe at least the Homo sapiens species, <laughs> but there are other species, other mutants and uh, so, but often looking maybe not from current, our human perspective. So always need to distance and trying to look more from mineral perspective, uranium perspective, particle, neutrino perspective, like all these different scales of time and scales of measuring us with the world. And I was recording sounds once for Cernomelia from collaborating with Norwegian Geodetic Institute and was fascinating how we always need this reference point of somewhere 
else just to understand like ourselves or earth's rotation movement of tectonic plates we need to like listen for this dying neutrino dying quasar and uh, dying star just to measure ourselves so see all these kind of failed progress you know scientific colossal structures as archaeology so i think i i look a lot in my work most of them from this archaeologist perspective finding these today's sites and questioning like what what they were doing here trying to to invent these particle collisions with a speed of light or I think like Chernobyl sarcophagus also will look like some attempt for an afterlife experience all these invisible traces it will be so yeah it's also I guess invitation for the ocean we all made from we come from water it's a very beautiful perspective and i have to say like in the in the climate care biennale that we just closed we had a large exhibition that was looking at very different angles of what is possible and what might be possible and what we can do and very much also activating the visitors and then i, I did a little a two-person show titled dark euphoria where I invited um, the artists to think actually what, what you said, like to think about our life from, from a distant future, um, playing a little bit on that uh, notion of the seventh generation principle where we think we have to try and, and uh, keep that planet alive for the generations who are come after us. And I asked him to think about uh, what, uh, what went wrong or wh why, why did we fail? And what would we miss from a time where we live now? And I think these thought experiments, as you said, um, and actually both of you said, help us a lot. The speculative uh, instruments help us sometimes much more than another statistic that we, if we are not experts, might not read as well as an expert does. Um, but these like uh, kind of uh, fearful, but then again, exciting scenarios uh, of looking back uh, from a future that it's still there, so it's a given that we will have a future, which I also like, um, can help us to, to become better in what we do now, hopefully, at least. And I think um, as we are speaking on behalf of the Photographers Gallery, I have also a question about like the images of climate, uh, the climate crisis, um, which are very, very often photos of, of destroyed nature or destroyed sites or images that are, are very dystopic of wildfires, obviously, or graphs and statistics. And I think what's what's very great about both of your works and the, also the, the kind of immersiveness or installation uh, field is that you can experience these things differently. So uh, I would ask both of you to, to kind of tell us what you think should the images of the climate crisis more be like, or what, what's your take on that? Do you feel the same? I mean, this, this is definitely something that, like, as you can see, I play with a lot, right? Like, Asunda is, you know, presenting these sort of fictions, but in this language of the dashboard and data, and like we are generating graphs from that climate model. And so it has, we're trying to like dress it up in this, you know, the language of science. Um, and I think, you know, I think that that language and though that imagery has, you know, serves a important role, right? That's how we understand this crisis. But I think it obviously has like massive limitations as well, like um, limitations in terms of, yeah, it doesn't tell us how this stuff feels and it doesn't tell us how like addressing it feels. And, you know, then you have the other extreme, which is what you're talking about, these like media, the media narrative, which is like, you know, the last polar bear on the ice 
kind of thing or the you know destroyed flooded place these disasters and I feel like, like I'm worried that of course that's only going to get worse and that we're sort of going to maybe even become a little bit desensitized to it because it already just this past year you know like I think we can all think of dozens of these events that you'd go onto the t Twitter and it's like <laughs> you're transported there um so I do think art has a role to try to develop new visual metaphors and and, and reach people where they're at and um you know envisage yeah how one can address this or think about this um on a personal level, not not necessarily to address it as an individual, like to think exactly, about it yeah. as a systemic problem where we need to be advocating for systemic change, but um, yeah, like invite, like e experimenting with that. What does that visual language look like? I don't know. I'm trying, but I, I don't have a like. I guess I'm not. No, but I, I think uh, you got a point. So you're using the visual language that is there, but you give it a twist, and people looking at your work will then have to dive deeper and say, oh, wait, that's not a normal satellite image. Or it's not the, the common graph that I know from the from the Sunday Daily. So I am, um, and also I think there's a lot of beauty in disaster. This has been critiqued a lot, especially in photography, much more than in the work both of you do, but like showing a melting gla glacier, for example, it can be a very touching image. And there's this kind of beauty in disaster feeling that's also taking hold and I think that's also in uh, Emilia's pieces that we now saw a glimpse of it uh, seems uh, still a beautiful world even though obviously there has been uh, some problems going on and, and things have been destroyed right so I am I mean I don't know if you want to add something to that Emilia you don't have to <laughs> yeah maybe I agree like um, yeah yeah it's uh, all the media load is often could be very distant and yeah the feeling the sensing part like do we does it really touch us like physically and emotionally i think um, personally for me like just being in those sites i work always site specifically immersing there with my own body for Siren Amelia training, swimming in four Celsius degree, like Arctic waters, <laughs> launching my own body there, like to feel it, to sense it. I sense it myself. I cry seeing those kind of melting, boiling glaciers, like first time I seen it, but how to transmit it. So I think sensory experience that's what i try to do through through the seating architecture design guidance and um, and maybe it often starts with very straight activism form but often it needs a mythology to communicate it differently like um, how to communicate about these burial nuclear sites, nuclear waste sites, about nuclear water contaminating in New Mexico, pregnant woman drinking that water. Like what, I don't know, just more raising the questions and having the discourse like now is also yeah. part of continuation always. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I think what, what both of you said, like this a kind of emotional um, trajectory is so important that always helps us to connect us uh, with the issues that are going on because we we all, and, and I do it myself, like you, you have to distance yourself at some point from some parts of the news because if you always feel everything so deeply, you how would you go on with your life? But then again, <clears throat> you have to kind of emotionally connect to do something. And um, uh, there was this uh, one uh, artist, designer, Alexandra van der Eyck, who contributed to the climate care exhibition as well. And she told uh, in her text that her work is about ecological grief. 
And I thought that was so inspiring to me, like to see, she wanted to experience, she, she photographed and 3D scans melting glaciers as well. And <clears throat> so like she felt the grief while sitting there and she wanted to transport that. And uh, we also had a work by Ludwig Berger who recorded the sound of melting glaciers. And also that by hearing that, it almost sounds like someone crying actually or being in pain uh, from an uh, anthropomorphical perspective. And I think these emotional components can help us to identify also more with species um, that are not human. And we had this one part of, of, of Vienna Biennale also in, in discursive formats and a uh, shout out to Anna Jane of Superflux, who was this based in London at this point, the more than human perspective and trying to change our vocabulary and discourse into also a more than human vocabulary. So instead of um, saying, um, making a solution, we use the word care. Or um, like uh, instead of uh, always referring to a human-centered perspective, um, let's think about the planet as an organism instead, as a whole and collectively, um, because every species has their role. And I think this notion ties in a lot with what uh, you both kept saying uh, at some point, or more Tiga, but collaboration with others. So also I think, Emilia, you have a, a larger team when you do producing these kinds of work. So collaboration between different fields and the different kind of senses might be the future. So um, is that something you would agree with or like what, what's your take on that? On doing something collaboratively to change things, as you said, systemic change. Yeah, I think that's key. I think, you know, there's been a lot of press lately around the sort of capture of the climate narrative and how the framing of it in on the terms of the individual has been strategically beneficial yeah. for the fossil fuel industry. And so I think, again, you know, um, there's a lot of work to be done in, in reframing that. Um, I think, you know, like that's why some the solar protocol project has been such an interesting one for me because you know it, we de de developed it at a time when you know one couldn't travel and by just the design of the network the fact that the network becomes more operational more functional stronger the more people get involved in it um, and those people have to be in different locations right so it's been a lot of like you know 2 a.m phone calls to like india or kenya or australia where we have servers and um, building relationships that wouldn't have come about um, except for, you know, with that kind of framework. So that's been a really exciting thing for me, right, is like thinking about like, what does low carbon culture look like? Okay, yeah, maybe I'm not going to get on a plane. Maybe I'm going to build a, you know, new collaboration with someone who is in the place where I need to work and like, let's think of new ways of working. I think there's lots of um, lots of unexplored territory and lots of potential with that, thinking about it as an opportunity. Absolutely. And I think this kind of decentralization and idea of, of um, sharing and commoning with knowledge, but also with resources is absolutely key. And I think it's kind of what an artwork like that can do, which becomes more than just that and enables actually, um, would enable actually uh, solutions if someone took that idea further in, and, and would implement it in a larger scale, right? Mm. Yeah. But yeah, I like, uh, sorry, you go. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was just gonna say, I think, I think that concept of care is also very rich because it also, you know, produces a way of thinking about ecology or about the environment that doesn't rely on like a technological metaphor as well, right? So right. I think, yeah, I'm, I'm, that's powerful, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, for me personally, I think, yeah, that's the probably the only path is, um, yeah, to go out more from this singular, you know, production and definitely collaboration is very important, both with researchers, activists, writers and uh, scientists and one of my long-term collaborations is together with artist Tanya Basse, 
we have the new mineral collective which we founded eight years ago and that's another long chapter in my practice new mineral collective platform looks at contemporary landscape and tries to understand the extent of human interaction with earth's surface and along with a group of mostly female identified international members we focus a lot on geotraumas and radical geology and the carving of new spatial geographies due to extractive industries and we always try to integrate these points of view of terrestrial geographic resources, both in performances, videos, and sculptures, and trying to work on our proposal with geotrauma healing therapies and um, bring in alternative forces, energies, and values to land into the world. Don't leave us. <laughs> Pleasure, desire. You're breaking oh. up. Oh, uh, yeah. And I see that the, there has been a question from the audience, which I just wanted to bring in as well when we speak about collectiveness. And um, do the both of you see an activism or activist element in, in your practice as an artist? What's the question? So, Emilia, maybe first. Yes, um, so as mentioned before, the New Mineral Collective with Tanya yeah. Basse, we work with these notions of counter prospecting mm -hmm. and uh, more like trying to preserve plots of land through acquiring actual uh, mining licenses to keep it passive and uh, protected and uh, more like working in this legal um, more language of geology and I think yeah it always starts with act with activism so Tiga, and we then know, it, we know well. then it merges somewhere else. So does does art do artists nowadays have to be activists? Actually, does does each one of us have to be an activist? Um, I don't think it, I don't think you I don't think you have to be, but I think given the moment we're in. Um, I think generally there is this sense that we need to be in conversation and dialogue with the world. And so inevitably that leads to yeah. a sort of activist um, dimension to the work. Um, you know, I think this is something that I've thought about a lot because, you know, I, I, my work often like sort of has this technological critique in it, right? It's in response to the narratives that, you know, mm -hmm. the techno utopianism that we're sort of like, often get lost in and so there is a desire to kind of like debunk that or reveal that it um there's another way that there's other ways to live and other ways to view the world um but i think you know there's also limits to um art as activism in that um i think it's a healthy dialogue right but i also sometimes it's alarming when particularly this has been in the ai space when um, art, like artistic responses that are kind of pointing to the problem, revealing the problem, get misread as sort of like solutions or, or yeah. you know, functional at scale responses because they're not really right. These these things need to address at different in different registers by like activists um, who are you know engaged in that type of work or you know through regulation or like these other kinds of Leaders. Yeah, and also through policy making, so the people who can actually then take on these things, because that's a discussion 
we we have a lot with artists and also with our audience during the Vienna Biennale about climate care. It's like, but what can art do actually, <laughs> apart from being there and being interesting or exciting or, or provoking? And uh, does it have to? Because it's like the solution is can also be dangerous, as you said, like to expect um, artists now to to solve every problem and save the world. Um, and indeed, they they still do uh, with with the work that you do. So, um, what's uh, maybe from last question from my part? Like, what do you think art can do in this urgency that we are living in? I think. Um, you know, I, I'm aiming to sort of feel out, test out, um, explore opportunities for change and intervention and other ways to design and build the world, like the, the, the solar protocol, for example, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's a project where you, you're likely not going to develop that in an industry context because it's inefficient, intermittent, it has all these affordances and characteristics because of the way that it is um, in response to the environment. Um, so it does something that, you know, gets read in other disciplines as problematic, right? But I think this is the shift we need to make because we need to be able to recognize that like if we are going to design with a sort of more than human politics or from a non-human perspective, our, our systems and our criteria for how we assess them need to change, right? It's going to look like inefficiency or non-utility or something like that for a while, right? And so I think as artists, and there's also a long history of this, this exploration of working, not working, I think yeah. there's a real intellectual history there that we can draw on that sort of points to that and and points to the fact that that's not necessarily failure. That's like a different set of values playing out in the world. So building a language and a literacy around that, I think, is really important and very valuable. Um, there's a really useful work and valuable work coming from the arts in that sense. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Thank you for that. Emilia? maybe like yeah to yeah. to kind of sum up all what we talked about so all those points such as bringing care or just like raising awareness bringing us closer to senses being more aware aware no matter more which ways it takes mm -hmm. to get there. Maybe it would take most um, unexpected path through science fiction, you know, distancing time and stretching manifolds in space just to arrive at the same place where we are right now, but just more aware. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you for that. I think we can all agree that artists, especially such as you two, can change the narrative actively, actually, and help us understand more about what it means to be human in a modern human world. And um, yeah, I would invite everyone who still has questions to the artists to, to post them now. Or otherwise, I would also ask uh, Luisa maybe to join us with some uh, remarks if she would like to. I don't know about time. I can't see any clock at this point. So, <laughs> um, oh, I'll add myself to the spotlight. Um, yeah, we have a couple more minutes in case anybody does have any questions. Otherwise, we might move to some closing remarks just because, um, yeah, it's getting a little bit past the hour mark. But there is still time. So, I don't want you to feel like you can't bring them. Mm. Might give it a silence and see if anyone comes with any questions. <laughs> I'm not seeing anything. Well, um, we might wrap things up then, but uh, thank you all for joining us, um, especially to our speakers tonight, Tika Brain, Amelia Scormalite, and Marley Zwerth. It was really interesting hearing about your work and we're really excited to see how some of your projects develop. I know Amelia started speaking about a techno in a cave, rave in a cave. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that. So maybe that can also prompt us to think a little bit more about the spaces around us in different ways. Um, to my colleagues, uh, Anna Daneman, Arya Frosch, and John Uriarte for their support tonight, and to you all for your ongoing commitment to the gallery. We wouldn't be here without you. Um, we continue to be grateful to be welcomed into your homes and have the opportunity to share the important work of these very interesting and very important um, artists. So if you have a moment, We'd love to hear from you. We're, we'll be doing a quick poll at the end of this if you have some time. And anyway, I hope you're all okay. And thank you all for joining us and hope to see you at the gallery if you are in London. Um, and if not, hopefully you travel by train or something so that it's a bit more mindful of the environment. But thank you all again. And yeah, I'll be in touch, um, Riley's, uh, Tiga and Amelia. So. Uh, over email since we're being recorded now. Thank you so much um, also. And also to the nice comments that we just received, thanking um, for the inspiring words. Have a great yeah. evening. Yeah. Have Thanks. a great evening. Bye. Thank you. Thank you everyone.